Well, let's get started with this uh, roundtable on transcribers for Asian languages. We have till 11 and then we have a coffee break. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce the speakers and organizers of this roundtable, who are uh, Rachel Griffith from the Australian Academy of Sciences, Franz Grave Erhard from the Leipzig University, James Henry Morris from Waseda University, James Hen um, uh, as well as uh, the University of London, uh, Alexander O'Neill, also University of London, and Li Shi Hua from Trinity uh, College Dublin and uh, Nicole merkel Hilf uh, from Heidelberg uh, University Library. Um, the, the floor is all yours. Uh, please take it away. Um, we have a mic over here and uh, this one also works. So um, we try. Uh, okay, um, thank you very much for this introduction. So there's not much left to say for me, I guess. Um, maybe. Yeah, thank you for joining us here. And um, the idea to, for this roundtable is a very kind of selfish one um, because sort of Rachel and I, we both work on Tibetan. And when I started with Transcribers only one year ago, I had uh, sort of the, the, the strong need and desire to get more information about it and some sort of uh, exchange with people who have already had more experience with the specific problems that Asian languages bring to transcribers. And that's how we had this idea to, well, uh, try to get together some people on, uh, uh, to exchange on, on, on issues with Asian languages, and maybe also find other people who are working with that, because this is a very, very difficult thing. You, you always start to reinvent the wheel from the beginning with these uh, languages. Yes, so what is next? <laughs> Hi, good morning. Um, so just to give a brief overview of how the roundtable will work, um, we're joined by two speakers online, Alexander and, and James, um, and obviously the speakers here in person. So we'll take it in turns to introduce ourselves, tell you a bit about the scripts that we're working with, um, and introduce maybe some of the um, challenges that we have working with uh, transcribers so far, um, and then we'll break out into a discussion. Um, we've got some points on the screen of some of the questions um, that we're not going to anchor ourselves to, but we might refer back to, um, to keep the conversation moving. Um, but also it's open to questions from the audience, so feel free to um, yeah, chip in with any tips, advice, questions, uh, thoughts um, throughout. So then Okay, that's me again. <laughs> so um, yeah, um, maybe you've uh, seen my short presentation yesterday. Um, I'm from Leipzig and um, working on a corpus of Tibetan newspapers. And what I want to do is sort of do a qualitative study of it. Um, but before uh, being able to do that, we need to get to the text actually. So um, yeah, and, and uh, what my problems with transcri transcribing is that in Tibetan, there are no con transcribing conventions, not really. So every project working with Tibetan is doing uh, it according to their own kind of ideas, which then results in like training data that is available, but it's useless for, for, for other projects. So I think that would be something at least in this area of Tibetan studies, people should kind of um, try to uh, talk to each other a little bit more. Yeah. And then I don't know who is next. Oh, oh it's you. <laughs> I feel like we're hogging this. Um, hi. So um, I'm actually, I've been working um, with Tibetan scripts um, on two projects. Um, so the first um, was at the Austrian Academy of Sciences, um, the project's called Tibskol, um, and the project wanted to uh, utilize transcribers to um, automatically transcribe around 500 um, scholastic texts um, written in a variety of different scripts, all Tibetan, um, but by different hands. 
Um, so I was working on this project um, from 2021 to last year. Um, and during that time, we developed uh, two HTR models, um, one called Drutzer, one called Betzuk. Um, and I'm hoping um, you can see these on the, the screen. Um, there's not much to the eye. There's not much of a variation between these scripts. Um, the one Betzuk, the lower um, two folios is slightly shorter, um, squarer, and could be is slightly more ornate. Um, but just those differences were enough to um, make the first model that we trained unusable on those scripts. Um, so we decided to develop a separate HTR model just for those. Um, and these were made publicly available in December. Um, and the character error rate um, we're quite happy with. And the project's now being able to use these um, to start automatically transcribing these texts. Um, one other thing to add is that, um, as Sabin mentioned, um, people working with um, Tibetan tend to use different um, conventions for transcribing Tibetan. And for this project, we used a transliteration system um, instead of Unicode, um, just because some of the transcripts um, were already available to us, use this system. Um, so we could cut some time by reusing those. Um, the current project that I'm working on is based in Paris at the um, Ecole Pratique Haute d'Aude, um, and again, working with uh, Tibetan manuscripts, um, this time with slightly different problems, but again, touching on what um, Zave said about conventions. Um, so these texts um, have abbreviations that are rendered in all different forms, um, and without there being a unicode or any convention for standardizing how we write these transcriptions. Um, there's also some interesting punctuation marks and codological features, um, like the two lines on the top um, folio that I've um, yeah, put a box around. Um, and also um, these texts use their own type of numbering system that differs completely from the Tibetan numerical system. Um, often they're used interchangeably, but again, there's no system for accurately um, transcribing or transliterating these. Um, so these are things that we're currently working on and trying to find a way of yeah, coming up with conventions and standardizations for these. So it's now my turn. I'm Nicole Merkel-Hilf from Heidelberg University. I've been using Transcribus since 2018, and we started to use it for the Devanagari script, which is a North Indian script used for various languages. And we mainly use it for the printed uh, texts in our collection. And these are texts from the 19th and um, early 20th century. We also had some trials with Urdu, um, script used in uh, Pakistan. And recently we started to work with Tamil, which is a South Indian script and different from um, the Devanagari script. Um, it, it's more rounded in the characters. It's ha it has no ligatures. And that was what that is what proved difficult for the Devanagari. It has a lot of uh, consonant compounds and sometimes up to four consonants um, clustered together into one uh, grapheme. And we also encountered difficulties with uh, the vocals, which are sometimes written beneath, sometimes below the character. And um, we also work with lithographically printed books. That means these texts have been handwritten on a stone and then printed. And uh, here we encounter often um, writing errors um, and or words that have been omitted. And then they are placed above the line. And uh, we really don't know how to deal with that. And so that it is clear where this um, added um, word has to be placed in the text. So we have, haven't found a solution for that. And that is what our material looks like. As you can see, it's quite simple as what in regard of um, regarding the layout. So we don't have much apart from page numbers, headings, and then the text. 
A bit more difficult is um, our uh, journal Saraswati, uh, which we are currently working on. It has two columns, but we found a solution for that. We trained a layout recognition model with um, P2 Pala, which works quite well. Yes, and uh, what else is there to mention? Ah, yes, our, our uh, Devanagari model, one of our Devanagari models for the printed. Uh, texts um, is comes out with a character error rate of just two percent, so that wor works quite well. And we published it for reuse on the Transcribus platform, and we also published the ground truth on um, our own ground truth archive at Heidelberg University Library. And now I think it's Alexander's turn. Hello. Uh, yes, um, I uh, I uh, developed a handwritten text recognition model for uh, Nepalese manuscripts written in the Pratchalot script, uh, like uh, those that you can see here um, on the um, on the folio um, that I uh, screenshotted here. And uh, this model that I developed uh, as part of an, an AHRC funded project uh, at SOAS University of London um, uh, essentially is, is made to recognize Pratchelet and uh, transcribe it into Pratchelet Unicode. And um, one, of the, one of the main difficulties I had uh, in creating this model was essentially baselines uh, or layout recognition. As you can see here in this picture, uh, this is th these are the results that I got using um, using um, I think it was using the Tibetan Pecha um, layout uh, recognition model. I got pretty good results with universal lines, but it also requires a lot of manual correction. Um, there are a lot of other issues. One of them is that um, there are very few manuscripts either in Sanskrit or Newar, and those are the two languages uh, which the manuscripts that I was working with uh, were in. There, there were very few um, uh, fully diplomatic uh, additions to work with. Um, so I had to, uh, essentially, I, I bootstrapped uh, Sanskrit editions of uh, some, San uh, some Sanskrit texts, which had, um, which had um, versions in a manuscript form, and that sped up the process considerably. And so using about four different manuscripts, um, uh, two, in, uh, two of them in Newar, and two of them in Sanskrit, I was able to, in 20, training, training the model in 2022, I was able to get a character error rate of 2.6. And um, then essentially um, uh, correcting, uh, correcting uh, new transcriptions and then refeeding them into the model, I was able to get a character error rate of 2.0. I also deposited my data on in the Heidelberg uh, University system, um, the Hey Data uh, system, and um, and uh, yeah, th th this is this is really part of a bigger project uh, that uh, I'm involved with, uh, whose goal is essentially to create a, a corpus of Newar, and since there are so few. Um, existing transcriptions of Newar manuscripts uh, or texts at all out there, um, whether diplomatic or edited. Um, this is really one of the first steps in our pipeline. And so it, it was really, uh, really essential. And it's, it's something that I, I'm still working on. Um, so uh, yeah, and I think that is about all that I'll say for now. Thank you. Thank you. Shuhal, I think you're up next. Um, yeah. Um, so hi, I'm, I'm Shuhali from Trinity Center for Asian Studies, um, Trinity College, Dublin. 
So, um, so like the focus of my page. Let me see something. Um, anyway, so like the focus of my research is the Tuzhou language, which is a minority language in central South China um, that belongs to the tibeto burman language family. And just to mention, like the Tuzhou language has no writing system. And you may wonder, like, how are they supposed to do, like, to have transcribers to transcribe a document in this language that has no writing system? So actually, the tradition, at least in China, um, to document languages that has no writing system is to use um, both Chinese and international phonetic alphabet, IPA symbols. So like here um, in this picture, this is a typical type of word list um, in China to document um, the minority language that has no writing system. So basically here we have all of the information structured in a table way. And the leftmost column here, we have the lexical meanings of the words um, recorded in Chinese and followed by columns pre presenting the pronunciations of the corresponding words in each and every dialect recorded. Um, so speaking of the training, the training for this model includes around roughly around 14,000 words, um, 345 pages, and we reached the um, and capture error rate at 5.9. And let's talk a little bit more about the training. So first about the layout. So initially we were trying to kind of develop a um, table model because everything's structured in the table way, but then somehow we decided it would be easier for us to uh, do like this on this page. So here we have only one text region identified and so like for each of the row in the table, we cover it with a baseline. So basically the, lex the lexical meanings in Chinese on the very left side, and then followed by the corresponding pronunciation. So the first row is just the title of the page, lexical world list. And the second row, um, um, we have three columns. Each of them are kind of tags of different dialects we have on this page. But still, like we ran into some of the issues, like if you can see here on the fourth row. Um, so like we here, we have um, the word, the word recorded for the lexical meaning sun. So here in the first dialect we have here, we have um, in this dialect, two different pronunciations of the same word recorded and it span two lines. So, um, Usually will, the case will be like the model cannot recognize this correctly. Instead, you will recognize say um, two different baselines and it will, it will also ruin the um, reading order of the file of the page as well. And somehow it cannot be solved um, by the model, by training new models. So basically um, speaking the latest version of the layout model, we can only um, manually correct it. And the transcription of Chinese. So the model now can recognized to uh, 2,400 characters. Um, but still we ran into some of the issues which can be seen in two ways. So the first is like creating, the model is, is ten, tends to creating new words. Uh, so here, like, I'm not sure whether if it should be called as an error, because um, as we can see here for the first two um, examples for creating. So like, um, so you always like the one on the left hand side um, it's the original version we give to train the model. And uh, the one on the right-hand side is like what we got from the model. So like if, if you can see, there are always several extra strokes added by the model. But like for the first, um, for the first pair, um, the one is actually not an error because it's an alternative form of the original word. Well, the, in the second example, the one on the, on the right hand side is like the traditional form of the Chinese character. Um, but even rarer, we, we kind of have the cases where we have the model combined a um, part of a Chinese character with another part of another Chinese character. So we, which makes completely a new Chinese character that is not existed in the language. And the second way we can see of the arrows replacing. So whenever it maps some say um, 
difficult characters that it cannot handle or deal with, it will kind of replace uh, what it has been trained. So as you can see from these um, two pairs, so still like the one on the left is the original version we give. Speaking of the IPA transcription, I, I think the model now can recognize say 100 IPA symbols, more or less it is all we have in the system. And the problem would also be like mixing, um, the model kind of mixing up some of the um, different symbols. So here we have um, the number two mixed with the um, stop consonant, um, yeah. So here we have numbers because of the language is a tonal language. And normally in China, the scholars will record it with numbers um, to represent different tone levels. And also we have um, the model to mix with two different, say, um, um, vowels. And that's basically all about it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think James has left. Um, James, do you have slides that you'd like to share? Yeah, so if it if it's possible. Yeah, hold on. Yeah, so um, I'll just need to set you up. You. Give us a second. Thank you very much. Apologies for not sending things on time. <laughs> It seems like I can I can share. So um wonderful. Right. So my name's James Morris. I'm working at Wasedi University and um yes, project details. Um I'm working with a sort of text called Kirishtan Ban, which is a Japanese um type of text, which was printed by Jesuit missionaries in the 16th and 17th centuries. And man, these texts pose some um, unique problems. Um, they tend to be written in up to four different languages in combination, um, predominantly in Latin or Japanese, but I believe if I'm not mistaken that every text contains some Latin script uh, and Latin language, and every text, I think, or most of the texts contain Japanese script as well. Um, but some are predominantly one or the other, right? So if you you can see my screen here on the left, we have a, a text which is predominantly um, Japanese. And uh, these languages then can be written in two scripts as well, right? So uh, um, they can be written, well, Japanese is a, it can be written in Japanese script or in Latin script. So on the right hand side, we have a, a text written in Latin script, but the language is Japanese. Um, and, and so this great mixture of languages and scripts is one potential problem we have. Um, but there's also some opportunities with these texts. Um, unlike uh, other late medieval and early modern Japanese texts. These are, uh, are printed using movable type print, which means there's a lot greater amount of consistency um, between the characters um, in comparison to uh, woodblock printed texts. And um, it also means there's a, actually a, a limited number of characters and variations, which there aren't in, in other Japanese language texts. Um, so myself and others independently have been working on uh, Kiddish Danban, and we tend, we're tending to get similar results. So um, I did two experimental models using um, um, texts written in Japanese language in Latin script, which, as you are likely aware, is going to have good results because it's in Latin script, right? So. Um, the first uh, model had a 1.29% uh, character error rate um, for the validation set, and the second uh, experimental model had a 2.68 um, character error rate. Uh, other scholars, um, Mia Gawaso and Sophie Nutzler, have uh, made a similar 
model with a 2.09% character error rate. The problem we tend to have with the Latin script texts is accents, um, which uh, tends to come out poorly. Um, and working on Japanese language texts, which I'm experimenting with, um, the problems tend to be at the early stages of layout, right? So it's vertical. Um, Transcribus does not deal with vertical text well. I Maybe someone has a solution for this, um, but I haven't found it. So it te we tend to have to do the layout manually. Um, yes, wonderful. And I, I'm, I'm hoping we can talk about some of some of these shared and um, unique issues later as well um, in our discussions. Thank you very much. And please keep sharing. sharing. Oh, <laughs> oh, oh, keep. You want? Uh, yeah, maybe. Um, uh, I, I would directly want to ask a question to, to James. Um, as okay. you see, pardon, can you hear me? Yes. Ah, okay, great. Um, so I guess sort of the, the Japanese text you're showing here is top to bottom, right? Yes, and yeah, top to top to bottom and right to left. Okay, so could you yeah. uh, share your experience in how that uh, works with Transcribus? Does it work at all? Did you do any? Um, yeah, so my ex my the experiments I'm doing with Japanese script are, are still in quite early stages, but um, trying to do any automated layout analysis is basically impossible. Um, it doesn't recognize lines, although these these are in quite clear lines, although um, um, some other Japanese texts perhaps don't have lines at all. These are all in very clear vertical lines. It tends to sort of just pick random characters and so you'll just have like a single character um as a baseline so um and the order is often uh in reverse because um uh, my transcribus is, is wants to work like this right um so here will be our first sentence rather than here which is our actual first sentence um but um Somi Agawa, who is also working on these sorts of texts, uh, I don't want to share too much of his work because I, I don't have permission, but he's told me that uh, a potential workaround for this is actually to flip the images um, ah. horizontally so that uh, this would no longer be vertical. And then you can recognize the lines fairly easily if you do that. But I've been trying to... Um, to keep the text in vertical layout, but yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Well, I'm I'm just like a step forward, but maybe then sort of we have uh, we start the discussion. Yeah. Well, you can moderate. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, yeah. Would you like to share your most pressing challenges? Um, I don't have challenges anymore with uh, the Devanagari script because that works quite well for our material. Um, the challenge we now face is with the Tamil script because here we're working together with a project at Heidelberg University at the Center for Asian and, Stud Asian and Transcultural Studies, CATS abbreviated. And they're working with printed Tamil texts, um, and they have two scripts in it, uh, the modern Tamil and the classical Tamil called, I think, Mani Pravalam. And as I understood, um, not all of the Mani Pravalam characters have a Unicode code, so that's a bit problematic. And they transcribe the Mani Pravalam in Devanagari. So we're currently training a mixed model with two scripts, Devanagari script for the Mani Pravalam text, 
and um, modern Tamil for the modern Tamil text. And what's a bit tricky is that you have um, not only you have the Mani Pravalam script also in the Tamil modern Tamil mixed up, so it's not separated uh, word by word. So, but um, the script, the two scripts are sometimes mixed in one word. And um, the first model we trained on only 20 pages came out with a character error rate of about 2%, which I think is okay because it, we only had 20 pages. And currently we're now transcribing more text or the colleagues from the project do that. And then we will uh, start training or uh, improving the model and then we will see how it works. But I, I'm not sure if um, this approach transcribing um, a script in another Indian or South Asian script is useful for the whole community. I think it's tailored for this particular project and um, I don't know if that is a good approach if you have the community as a large in mind. Well, uh, I think it's very interesting because uh, uh, even though um, I'm only working with Tibetan, but in, in, in those newspapers I'm working with, there's also some Chinese. And uh, what happens with this Chinese there from the 50s, so this was when sort of simplifying Chinese characters was in the sort of beginning, and uh, characters were not simplified altogether, sort of brought from the traditional character to the, to the now standard unicoded uh, uh, character, but there were steps in between. And so in our newspapers, we find a lot of um, characters that are not in Unicode. So we have no, uh, not, no real way to, to, to transcribe them in transcribers. So it seems also uh, uh, a bit related. So we'd be lacking the Unicode characters. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, at the moment we're just leaving it out. So we're not transcribing the Chinese text for that reason. And, um, and a similar problem I think is with the, um, the scripts Rachel is working. Um, was this on? Yeah. Um, yeah. So I was actually going to ask you, I think quite a few of you are working with, um, just from your presentations, scripts where there's no Unicode equivalent, so, or not always. So just what approaches have you taken? Obviously, Zava just mentioned that he's omitting some of those that are tricky, which is, I guess, a short-term solution, but maybe not a permanent solution. So I was just wondering if anyone's developed an approach to this because we haven't yet we're right at the beginning of our project in Paris so I was hoping to kind of yeah see what other people were doing and yeah have some things to think about when I go back um, I know from an, another project uh, in, in Germany OCRD they worked with uh, the German Fraktur um, scripts which are also tricky and um they develop best practice guides for transcribing. And if I remember correctly, they transcribe um, characters that don't have a Unicode uh, code um, in, the, in the ASCII code. But then, of course, you cannot train the data models with that. But that might work uh, when, you, um, when you correct the um, text that comes out of transcribers and then you might replace the omitted uh, characters with the ASCII mm. code if that works for your scripts. I don't know, but that might be a that might be a solution. Yeah, something I could look into. And Shihua, you're the same, right? Do you have other elements of your scripts where there's no Unicode equivalent? Actually, um, that's actually very rare. So, like, only maybe one out of a hundred pages. So, literally, just manually corrected. So it's no kind of useful approach for now. Um, my, my texts have some some characters which don't exist in Unicode. Um, if I show the slide again, um, down here we have a, a character which consists of a, a D, a, a long S and a tilde combined. So it's a sort of ligature, but it acts like a Japanese kanji. So it's it has a reading, 
like a, a Japanese character would have a reading rather than a, it's not a phonetic sound, it's a, it's a word. Um, and there's no way to type these into a computer. So it, as part of this wider project, we developed a font which would allow these special characters. There's about 30 of them and they appear fairly regularly on this page. Just quickly looking, I can see three or four. Um, but yes, um, there's no possible way to put th this new font into Transcribus at the moment. So um, what we the, there are some competing standards in the field, but uh, usually um, people put these uh, special characters into um, some sort of Latin equivalent. So since this is a a D, a long S, and a tilde, people tend to put it as a D and an S in transcriptions. So that's what I've been doing. Um, Sorry, I'll stop sharing again. Yeah, thank you. Um, just to kind of go back to um, to the Unicode. Um, so I'm I've been working with uh, Chinese HDR, but not in Transcribus uh, with this scriptorium. And the decision that was that was made there with characters. So there's a lot of character variants, and some some of them are available in Unicode. Some of them are not. So the kind of consistent, the decision for consistency that we made was that we're going to transcribe with the, the character that has, that is closer to the meaning of it, not, not the, the visual uh, similarity. And then as a second stage in the future, when one develops then a font or develops those characters in, in Unicode, then you would just replace those places where you transcribe the character, not in the right way, but in the best way that that was decided in that point in time. Um, and then just a small comment on the, on the vertical um, segmentation in Transcribus. So I know that um, um, Emma Stanford from uh, one of the libraries in Stanford, she was, she created um, a training for uh, vertical, um, vertical text for, for Chinese. Um, but the next the next stage is um, the the transcription. So, to my knowledge, that doesn't exist just yet in Chinese in transcribers. But I think the approach there, the idea was to then having to segment each character um, as 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 a text region and then create a, a baseline for for that. So it's uh, a, a bit painful, but uh, that's that's a possible approach for, for a language which has so many characters and it's written, could be written in a vertical form. Thank you very much for that. Can I add a small suggestion just to, for consideration, maybe with the new fields models, you can try to create sort of columns, so to say, and that might also kind of add. Yeah, that's um, um, in 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 my newspapers. I try to uh, sort of train this to to recognize sort of vertical Chinese, um, and in in and it sometimes kind of works. So it finds two or three lines, and then in other cases, it just like totally fails. So it's it's and uh, but probably. Again, sort of adding more data could possibly help, but yeah, even though it's yeah, it's it's I don't think it's very promising. <laughs> so, Potentially, in terms of collaborating, which is really other pages, the other people submitted, it could be not even in the language that they're working on, but potentially could be helpful or whatever. Not sure if it's something that you just want to relay that, check that they had. So I don't know how much they can share. Uh, have you heard that online? So the suggestion was no. to. to <laughs> the suggestion was to, to in order to kind of be able to train a model that is capable of uh, uh, detecting the layout of vertical Chinese or vertical Japanese or maybe even Mongolian, is to to try to train a layout model that works for all sorts of vertical scripts. Sort of get 
training data from other projects and then uh, um, combine that. Yes, maybe. I guess that would apply to you as well, like Alexander. Obviously, it's a different script because it's horizontal, but in terms of your layout, it's quite a standard layout for lots of other um, languages with that gap in the middle. So maybe working with other projects as well and sharing data might be a, a step in the right direction. Just a thought. Yeah, it, it usually, um, although recently it's, it seems to be a bit better, but, but what I was noticing when I was training the models uh, a couple of years ago and last year was it was detecting a layout very similar to what you would expect in a European newspaper with multiple columns, uh, because there are uh, holes in the middle. Uh, uh, there, there are lines which are divided by uh, gaps where, for example, there would be a, a string hole to keep the folios together or where they would put uh, an illustration uh, in more ornate manuscripts. But the, but the lines um, continue uh, across those gaps. So yeah, perhaps uh, training a, a layout model which is able to just um, uh, deal with that and then sharing that would be uh, the best way going forward. Um, what I realized from the discussion yesterday and also today that I think there are two major issues when it comes to the Asian languages in general. The first one is, as we already discussed, the vertical lines. This has been a discussion for years, I think, how to solve this issue. And I think it should be more of a priority to finally find a solution for that. Because um, we are facing it so often that these texts are written from top to bottom and still there is no good layout solution yet where even everything starts like and then it even comes to the transcription so it should be kind of like um it starts from maybe making small baselines for each character and somehow down there in uh, the transcription that it all is represented as one line that this can be realized somehow but um i'm not a programmer i don't know how it works but um I think um, that would be maybe for the transcribers team to take like maybe some notes that this should be like a top priority to make like a layout analysis from top to bottom or maybe a layout model if you want. But um, yeah, this should be like really um, something that should be more of a concern because it affects so many Asian languages. And the second one um, that I came across from like your presentation, Xava, and also today and Nicole from Devanagari, that um, vowels are not recognized properly. Like that if the character is up or like down, there's a small ad that the vowel is not recognized. I think this is also like across the Asian languages that this is an issue that should be worked on, that these small things should be like more considered. I don't know how it's technically possible to be more precise in this case, but just for me personally, to sum up this, I think these two problems are the one where trans we can suggest this to transcribers to make these a top priority because it affects most of the projects on Asian languages, I think. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Top priority, I think, yes. Um, there's actually like uh, one issue I am encountering is, uh, I don't know if the slides um, uh, Rachel shared with the Tibetan, you can see there's uh, gaps in the between, and it's not uh, separating sentences, but it's just sort of a, a, a pause or a writing convention. Um, and then also you have white space in Tibetan sometimes, sort of there's uh, between text and numbers, for instance, there is a white space. And it seems that transcribers, once you do the automatic transcription, it replaces any white, any space as a single space. So uh, in my transcription, I end up uh, losing sort of the information that is in this longer gap. And um, I also, since white space is white space, there's also no simple way to replace it. So I think this is, I don't know what 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 is why this occurs because in my transcriptions I checked, and also in the XML output and everywhere, uh, in the ground truth there are tabs still, 
So they disappear in the automatic transcription. So I don't know, this is, uh, well, creating downstream many, many uh, problems now. So it's, uh, I guess to maybe to kind of respond to that, I guess it's it's possible to just create yourself some sort of convention on on how to handle the white spaces that you want to preserve. So, for example, you you decide that a certain character is representative of the space, and then later on you can you can do some whatever you want with that. Just well, kind of, that means that we have now to go back and and do that in the ground truth, of yeah, course. I know. And uh, and I think I heard rumors there are other characters that are kind of sort of simplified into sort of dashes into one single. So it would be maybe also a good thing for transcribers to let us know what characters are actually there to, to be transcribed. Yeah. Um, I, I do have a question. It follows up from what uh, Anamika was, was asking before. And it's kind of like an, an open question is whether every, anyone has tried field models on to use that for uh, recognition and, and segmentation because it's quite more advanced than, than the P2PA line. It might, might be dealing well with these issues of these holes and spaces that we still want to kind of to 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 express that they are there we don't want to lose that information so just whether if just interested if anyone has tried to use field models for this type of material or this type of text stressing that it's still in beta so it might be off the radar for some people More questions or suggestions so far? I have a question for other people, um, if possible. Uh, one of the things we tend to face with Japanese texts, which not only with transcribus models, but also, you know, also all OCR platforms, um, is the existence of interlinear gloss it's pretty can be pretty heavy in japanese texts either telling us how to read characters um in terms of their pronunciation or telling us the order of reading characters um or things like this and the, the general solution so far has been we just ignore anything that is in between lines um i don't have a solution but i wondered if other people uh, have sort of a similar um, similar features in their texts. Uh, is there a lot of sort of this extra textual material? Um, and uh, Matt, what what are you doing with it? Um, is my question. Maybe I'll go first. Um, yeah, so in Tibetan texts, you often get interlinear glosses. Um, and with Tibskull, we decided to actually ignore them. Um, we tried, um, so the layout recognition was the first step. It often ignored them because they're so closely packed between the two lines in a text that it just assumed it was part of either the, the line above or beneath. So it would kind of warp the shape of the um the baseline um so that would have needed a lot of manual correction and retraining to try and um yeah get a baseline model that would recognize those as separate and then when we did manually draw them out and tested the htr they're often too small or there's too much um noise going on um for them to uh be accurately transcribed um, so for now, we just decided to ignore those um, and only mark up the glosses that were in the margins of the text. Um, so not much help, but um, yeah, that was our experience. So no, far. It, it shows that there's, our fields are doing the same thing, basically. But, cool, thank you. Did anyone else have interlinear glosses? Um, as I mentioned, we have this uh, phenomenon in the lithographically printed text when, for example, a word has been omitted and it is written between the lines. And uh, what we do with this, we just draw another line and then uh, have this single word recognized. And um, But the output, of course, is unsatisfactory because when someone uses this um, 
recognized texts, uh, the person won't know where to place this single word. But it's still there and it's uh, searchable. And um, in our presentation, users can compare the image with the um, OCR text, and then they might be able to identify where the word from this one single line um, appears in the document. But Thank it's you. not an ideal solution. Right. <laughs> Sorry, it's me again. Um, I ju just to say, I remember that there used to be um, a page on the Transcribers website on transcription conventions. And right now when I click on it, it just goes to the help center. So maybe it's just broken. Okay, it's in. Okay, I tried to, to search the help center. I couldn't find it. Um, anyway, that this could be a, a good place to record decisions that are made by um, by people like us who deal with Asian languages, and then that could be like the go-to place to uh, to look for um, perhaps best practice. So things that we kind of like together decided that this is how we would like to do it, um, and that could also also help with the with the issue that was raised here about the, the the ground truth if if it's you know if people use different you know different schemas or different conventions and then and then it becomes useless for other projects if they do follow the same guidelines then then one could use then the same uh, ground truth to you know to improve and create models just out of interest is this something that anyone could submit to the convention so is it open to projects? I see Miriam nodding <laughs> Please do just uh, submit it to us and we, we can add it to the to help center pages or something. Great. Yes. Even if it's really big. So if it's a project set of conventions. I mean, we can add links and, and stuff oh, like that. Okay, so. perfect. Great. Thank you. And there's also Zenodo where there is this community that you can link to, which can link to Transcribus. So there are solutions. So final words. Well, in given the time, um, I would very much like to thank the speakers and the discussion for Asian languages. And um, I can just say there were quite a few people from the team here, so we did hear you. Okay. <laughs> so thank you very, very much and a warm applause for you. <laughs>